everybody, welcome to Nation. My name is Jersey, and you are here. Uh, this is Window Cleaning Resource and WCR Nation. And this is like episode number 53, I believe. So, welcome. What's up? If it's your first time here, thanks for checking us out. Hopefully, it doesn't suck too terribly, and you want to go back and watch some previous episodes. Like I said, it comes out weekly, so you get a new episode every single Friday. You got a lot to catch up on, so get to it. Um, if you are part of the nation, one of the cool kids, somebody who watches every episode or listens to it on podcast, what's going on? It's because of you that I get to do the show. So thank you, Virtual High Five. It's awesome. And if you are one of the elite, somebody who does all that fun stuff, all the cliche thumbs up, subscribes, and you buy your supplies directly through me, then it's because of you that I get to eat. So thank you doubly as much. But if you want to order any of your supplies or have any questions on any products or supplies that we sell, uh, my direct number is 862-312-2026. That is a sell. So you can go ahead and text that, call it, whatever. Even if you want to text me, say what's up, uh, tell me your business name, where you're from, and that you watch the uh, show or listen. I love to hear that stuff. So thank you for that. Also, um, I have a few shout outs to do, uh, today and there is a winner every single week. We do this. A winner is chosen at random and that winner is this week, Donnie Don from last week's episode. Now, Donnie Don, you won a $50 credit to window cleaning resource and a swag bag, man. You got the t-shirt, uh, pin sticker pack. You got everything, the whole swag bag. All you need to do is just email me your info, Josh at window cleaning resource, and I'll get that sent out to you. And if you want to win every single week, all you got to do is comment on the YouTube version of this video. And every week we pick a winner at random and you could win a credit swag bag, whatever we're giving away at that time. So that is super, super awesome. A uh, couple of quick shout outs. Also, uh, Jeremiah Hickey, what's going on, man? Brian Stone, and of course, Sam Kerber. Uh, you guys are all awesome. Thank you so much for everything you do. Your kind words, blah, 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 all that. Um, I want to kind of speed this beginning up because people have said it's taken too long, but I need to talk about the huge convention one more time, and I'm going to say that every week because it's going to happen until we go. I'm excited. Uh, I know uh, Chris is excited. It's just, it's an awesome, awesome time. It's going to be August 23rd and 24th at the um, Marquis Marriott in Atlanta. Um, the the space is amazing. Atlanta is super easy to get to. It is possibly going to be the biggest one we've ever had. Uh, so that's super, super, super awesome. If you haven't been to a show or a convention, this has to be the first one. Tickets are super cheap to fly there. It's Atlanta. Everything goes through Atlanta. Um, and the hotel is amazing. The conference is awesome. There's even a hog hunt in the beginning of the week. It's just awesome. So if you haven't gone to a convention, definitely make it to a convention. Um, you won't regret it. It definitely is like the best ROI I've ever spent on my business. I know that. Um, but anyway, with the introduction, we are talking today to the one and only Chrissy Lambo. What's going on, man? What is up, Josh? How's it going, man? It's going. Thanks good. for having me on again. Oh man, it's uh, you know you've been begging to be on here, and I just I haven't I haven't found the time to get you on. Just so keep I blowing me off, keep me blowing <laughs> off. I was excited to be on this episode. I wanted to be on this one because it's like episode fifty-three, which is technically technically episode one of season two because you literally right. put one out for 52 weeks in a row super consistently haven't yeah. missed one they've all been amazing so i'm excited to get in you know on <laughs> season two episode one starting the new season off completely fresh and awesome yeah, yeah. so you're you're actually going to be at the convention too i know you are super busy usually so you're running around and not not necessarily just hanging out but are you super stoked for the convention uh, I'm super stressed out about the convention. <laughs> yeah, uh, I usually like, you know, lead the three, four months leading up to the convention. It's kind of a stressful period cause it's just an intense planning period. A lot of people don't realize how much, uh, logistical work goes into it behind yeah. the scenes, the coordination with the hotel and the speakers and the vendors. And it's a constant process of trying to, uh, appease multiple personalities to pull it all together. 
And uh, I'll be excited the first day I get there and it's kind of all done and set up. I usually get in like Tuesday or Monday and kind of get settled in in the hotel. And then then I get into excitement mode as, you know, friends and customers I haven't seen in years start pouring in the door and there's lots of handshakes and smiles and, oh, good to see you again, bro. <laughs> then it gets exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I always tell people. People don't know how much work you guys actually had to put in. I mean, even down to you know, how many microphones you need to have for each venue. It's like, it, it's absolutely crazy logistics to make this thing look like it took no effort at all. It was really crazy. So I'm really glad that I'm not part of any of that. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the many things that makes the huge convention uh, significantly different than other industry events is we try and have the event in a super upscale hotel, like just a really nice pe place. That's going to really wow people. You know, we're not, we're not putting these in days in or Ramadas or anything like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we, we try to like make it a really good experience all around and have everything neat and clean and uh, negotiating and working with a hotel on that magnitude, you know, like a, a really nice place requires just so much more extra work because they're just very strict with what can be done and stuff yeah. like that. And the dumb thing that comes up is that, these have to be planned like in advance major like you know next year has to be the like hotel and everything has to already all come together but this one's gonna looking to be a really really amazing year just i think atlanta is gonna yeah. be great there's so much to do there uh, i know my family's coming down i hear that from a lot of people that their whole family's coming down they're kind of making a vacation which is awesome because it's really a write-off you know talk to your tech adv tax advisor but it's a write-off so have your family come down and make some fun of it they got like uh they have one of i think there's like something stupid like seven pandas in the whole country as far as zoos go and atlanta has one so if you're like bringing kids <laughs> there you get to see a giant panda there's only seven pandas in the country it's something stupid like that it might even be less i gotta like yeah. fact check my you know stuff but yeah it's crazy I'm not a huge Panda fan, but... <laughs> I, I don't know. think I've ever seen one in person, so maybe it would be a good opportunity to check one out. There you go. See, there's no Panda in New Jersey? Uh, not that I'm aware <laughs> of. We always try to make the convention in a location. Uh, you know, we've had it in New Orleans. We've had it in Washington, D.C. We've had it in Nashville a couple times. And we always try to have it in a location that's uh, pretty centrally located for the vast majority of window cleaning and pressure washing contractors. If you were to like map them all out yeah. and Atlanta is shaping up to be pretty big because compared to years past, this is by far the highest concentration of potential attendees. So yeah. it's, it's shaping up pretty good. Yeah. And the, the thing that is nice is that you could fly right into Atlanta and that that's one thing that even you're talking like a couple hundred not even a couple hundred bucks, or you're talking about maybe a hundred dollar difference for layovers and all that. This, I mean, almost anybody from anywhere in the country can get a direct flight to Atlanta. So it's just a really easy location to get into. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. But anyway, so I got a little off track, but today I would love to talk to you about the regrets that you've had in business. Now, if people don't kind of know, a quick summary from you is you started a business, you grew the business, you sold the business, and now you're in the supply side of things and the resource side of things for, you know, forums and uh, groups and the learning side of things. Um, I know that we've all had like super regrets. And I was talking to Mo the window cleaner, if you know who that is, and he was talking about it too. We're going to be doing an episode within the next week or so. And he wants to talk about regrets too. And I think it'd be really kind of interesting to just get regrets from everybody and see if they kind of line up or if there's just stuff that's way out there that nobody would ever think of but you have to experience it before you can fi figure out it's a regret because at the time you think that's the best decision because obviously you made that choice at some time so if people don't know give us a quick timeline of kind of how everything went years you know this is the year i started this is the year i sold this is the year i kind of grew what kind of give a quick summary of it uh, all right, so a quick timeline was it's like 1999. I got a job as a window cleaner with a local guy. By late 2000, I had started my own business. It was like September. Um, 
And then by 2007, we had started Window Cleaning Resource, and we were running that in tandem with our window cleaning business. And uh, I sold the window cleaning business in 2013. So I essentially had 13 years running my old business, all county window cleaning. And then we just flipped focus completely to just working on window cleaning resource, mainly just because I saw, you know, bigger and better opportunities there and it was easier to scale. Yeah. And there was a need for it. I mean, there was a lot of, I mean, people don't remember before like the boom of um, kind of forums and all that stuff. There was like email groups. Gary's group was awesome, but it was an email group. It just wasn't, there wasn't a central location for everything. I remember stupidly, but I remember you were in, I think, I think you were in Gary's group or one of them and you're like, Oh, Hey guys, I'm starting this. And you looked like you were like 17 at the time. Um, but you were starting this, this group and I'm like, Oh, that's adorable. These guys there, nothing's going to happen. I was actually like the fifth person on your forum or something. I like third, third. Yeah. So I remember seeing it. I'm like, Oh, I'll join just so they have somebody. And then it turned into what it is. So, but through that whole time, there has to be like times that you remember, like looking back and being, man, if I didn't do that, like I know because if people haven't known, you wrote a book, uh, the um, uh, Window Cleaners Marketing Blueprint, and in that book you kind of, kind of outline everything. But there was a time where in the very beginning you kind of just did it for money, like beer money basically, or lift tickets for the uh, ski, you know, town or whatever. Um, I know a lot of people are like that, and they look back and they say. If I would have given it what I give it now, I could have been 10 times where I am now. Because every year you build on what you've built. So if you built it 50% bigger, your next year going to be 50% on that 50%. And it's just kind of a, you know, it builds on itself. So so let's talk about what are like your main regrets from when you start a business. Like the first year in business, what did you remember being like, oh man, I effed up that one. Um, well, you know, there's obviously a whole bunch of regrets over the years, like feels like a million of them. Ultimately they don't matter too much, but, uh, if I was going to, dist- and I, I definitely make it a point to not harp on regrets. Cause like, why worry about something twice? Right. You know, it's, it's already happened and just use it as a learning experience to build on, you know, to, to build future things on. Yeah. But um, if I could go back in time for that 13-year period running the window cleaning business and kind of highlight a few of the top regrets in order, uh, probably probably number one would be not thinking big enough. Like it, when I went out on my first job and was cleaning windows by myself that day at Karen Hershercheck's house, I still remember it. I pass it every day on the way to work. Like when I was on the job site that day, it all instantly clicked for me. Like, oh my God, if I just had 20 other people doing this with me, I could be making like 20 times as much money. (laughs) So on that day, I sort of like, and sort of developed this plan of what things would look like. And then shortly after that, I read the E-Myth and then like went to an E-Myth conference. And that really helped me to like crystallize the vision of what the company would look like when it was done. Yeah. And I built this picture in my head. I was like, all right, yeah, I'm going to have these trucks in this office and this call center, and it's just going to work like a Swiss watch. And the problem was by 2006, I had done exactly that. Like I did in like six or seven years what I expected to take 20 years to do. Yeah. So immediate regret was not thinking big, big enough because once I got there, I was like, eh, all right, I'm done. I'll write so, this for a while. Yeah, and we stopped, yeah. and then like we started window cleaning resource that year, and then you can kind of see, you know, uh, you know, we were growing at rates of you know four hundred percent a year, hundred percent a year, fifty percent a year, thirty percent a year, twenty percent a year, and then like you know we continued that twenty percent growth track after uh, two thousand seven, but really I had sort of mentally checked out because I had done what I had pictured, and I hadn't there? pictured beyond that. And I just didn't know what to do. Yeah, you know. I just became complacent with it. So that, yeah. that was like one one major regret. Um, another one that stands out in my mind is when I was in that rapid growth phase and hiring a lot of people, you know, I hired a bookkeeper and like an operations manager 
and you know someone to manage the money over here and someone to do this and someone to run the call center and a major mistake i made was like abdicating instead of like i was basically abdicating the duties to them as opposed to kind of like assigning the duties to them and making them own it so i was just like here you just take care of this and i don't have to think about it anymore and that was a major mistake because as soon as i did that it like sort of deviated from what i would have done you know i i wish i played a bigger role in uh controlling how the finances were run and how the operations were run and i just sort of said here you you take care of this and i don't have to think about this you take care of this and i don't have to think about that major mistake for two reasons one because i never became good and proficient at those things like bookkeeping money management uh operations and two it, it just drifted so far off from my original vision i was just like extremely dissatisfied with how all these core areas of the company were running yeah. and i just had no control over it anymore because it was like oh all right well these people have been doing this for three years this way and here i come and say all right pump the brakes it, things got weird right right so well well that's the the thing that if you lose control which you don't even know you're losing control the whole it's like building a foundation that has a crack and at the entire house then is built on that crack you can't go back and redo the entire foundation with a house on top of it so it's very hard you have to kind of almost watch every piece of it happening and control it all which micromanaging has always been put up as a bad term but if you think about it you're getting somebody in who knows bookkeeping i hate bookkeeping but if you get a bookkeeper and they know it they can run things and do use their brains to do it but to do it with your vision allows them to kind of still head in the same direction that you're going which is huge and people don't think of that either when they're building because they don't realize all the different pieces i mean how dumb it is when you have to hire a bookkeeper for the first time or somebody to stuff envelopes or these little positions where you're taking hats off but these people that are coming in they have to kind of create something from nothing because it didn't exist before it's uh pretty tricky and yeah. On the beginning part where you said that, um, you know, one of your regrets was um, losing or having a vision and never changing it for six years. You had six years to change that vision and keep keep moving it. And that's the really hard part. That's how companies actually fail when you see, um, okay, Kodak. Kodak still exists. They knew that film was not film. There is no, they just stopped selling actual film uh, or producing it maybe like six months ago. It was in the news. So, but they've gone into imaging and a bunch of other stuff. Well, they saw the writing on the wall. You know, they changed their vision. They never stop it. It's those companies that have one idea in their head and go, this is where we're going. The whole world around them is constantly changing, but they don't change. Those are the companies that can drive themselves into the ground because they're not changing with what's actually happening. They kind of stuck to that plan. So, Absolutely. Pretty- and, you know, when you, like, read the story of Kodak, they were a company of massive innovation and constant reiteration and they gra- they gained so much ground in the first hundred years of operation because you know the original core owners carried on their vision and it was all about reiteration and innovation and then all of a sudden that kind of changed when those original owners passed things down to family members and they just turned into we are a uh, film producing company yeah and he actually invented the digital camera and could have totally decimated <laughs> and owned that space but they didn't because they were protective of their uh you know film producing revenue and it just destroyed them that almost plays into the second part that you said is as soon as you've handed pieces of your company to other people to kind of do they had their own vision and did their own thing and never got you lost almost sight of where you are you always have to be kind of the one with the leash you know I have to be kind of running everything. Yeah. That's crazy. So yeah. with the beginning, now people who are listening to, they there might be like you that they say, well, I'm just going to stay a small company. And there's nothing wrong with that. I always say, whatever you do in your company is right because it's your company. This is what you can do. But if you think about this stuff now or think about hiring, even if you have no intention of hiring, if it ever comes up, you've already done research and subliminally you already know some of it. It's kind of the same thing. Now, your company is up and running. You're having super growth mode. What hindered you in growth? Like, what would you say if you could go back and go, okay, well, 
I only did 100% this year. I could have done 400 if I would have changed that. Is there like one thing that you think that in that growth period, heavy growth period, you could have changed to increase the growth? Better focus, better focus. Like the moment we started WCR, we fell in love with it and we were just like, yeah, all right, this is the new thing. All right, all you old people just <laughs> run that and uh, I'll pop in for an hour a week, grab my paycheck, make sure nothing burned down and I'm out. Yeah. And you know, that was like a major, major mistake because what I really should have done was set immediately at that point, set the company to just be sold and pass it on to somebody so I could uh, – you know, just transition yeah. into what I love to do, which is window cleaning resource. But, um, you know, I held on to it for a while because it was paying me a pretty significant amount of money. You know, it family on the payroll, it paid for my vehicles and a good yeah. lifestyle. Right. And, um, so I was just, I just kind of kept it around like that, but really I should have, I should have moved on from it, uh, brought a professional manager in to, to do it, or I should have just sold it a lot sooner. Yeah. And the thing that people uh, don't realize, we know it, but we don't realize it is that a, a good trait of a business owner is ADD. Like to be able to do a thousand things at once, that is a great trait of a business owner because we have so many things going on. The downside is, is that business boredom kicks in. And that's why you see a lot of these people always got something else going on. How many people do you know own a window cleaning company, but they also do this and they also do this and, and they're doing this. And, and then what happens is there's only a hundred percent of you. And if you try to split some of that up now, if you want to give even time, you can only give 50% to two different things. You know, you've just drastically dropped that. So that's the same thing. You probably couldn't do WCR as focused as you wanted and you couldn't do all county as focused as you wanted so you kind of let both of them you know lack a little bit yeah totally um you know i run wcr now on kind of some different principles it took us a couple of years like once i sold the window cleaning business it left me with like a pretty massive hole in my life of like i realized how much i did love it once it was gone yeah and it left me with like so much more free time and yeah, I had WCR to work on, but I hadn't like, like totally formulated the WCR vision. It took us quite a few years to get into a groove there. The yeah. supply business is brutal. You know, it's uh, it set, there's seven major suppliers in the United States and they've been around for a hundred years, 60 years, 40 years, 20 years. And for somebody to come in off the street and like try to take a piece of that, way way harder than i thought and it took yeah. us a lot of years to get into a, a groove there and i think we're in a pretty great groove there now but it took a while to just figure out like this is this is how i want to do it and this is how it'll work and i, I try to operate it now off some different principles and like think real super long term so uh, I'm 40 and I figure I got 40 more years left in me to do this because, yeah, I'm not going to retire at 60. You know, what am I <laughs> yeah, do? Yeah. So now I operate off like just basically deconstructing the next 40 years of the business and working backwards, you know, and I routinely sit down and ask myself, like, what's the one thing I can do in the next 10 years such that by doing it, everything will become unnecessary or totally obsolete. And then from there, I deconstruct it further. What's the one thing I can do this year? What's the one thing I can do this month? What's the one thing I can do this week? And what's the one thing I can do today to kind of get to where That's I want to go? So yeah. I have like a, a very singular vision of where to take the company, but it's a 40-year plan as opposed to like this arbitrary, yeah, yeah, I want to have 10 trucks and 30 employees. And <laughs> I never like took into account, well, okay, that should bring me X amount of money personally. It should give me X amount of days personally. It should allow me to live this kind of lifestyle. Like I learned a lot, you know, it's been a great learning experience. Yeah. Well, if people don't know, you're very, um, numbers, you're a numbers guy. So taking all of that, I mean, if you could see your spreadsheet collection, I imagine you'd cry a little bit just seeing it all. But um, one thing with goals is, or even doing bidding or anything this kind of translates into is that having a big focus, you can't just go, oh, in 40 years, I want this because there is no way to get there. It's like, I, I want to go to California. Okay, well, there's, how do you get to California? What route do you take? What You can't just get in a car and go because you're not going to know the route. You're just going to run into accidents. You're going to run into dead ends. You're going to get all that stuff because you don't know the path you need to take. So focusing on if you do want to go to California in the same sense, okay, 
what am I going to do to take there? How am I getting there? Breaking it down into small pieces. You can control your day. You can't control your next 40 years as a whole, but you can control every single day in those next 40 years to get there. And that's, I think people really lose focus too, is because guys say all the time, ah, I'm going to have 10 guys and, and, uh, you know, like you said, 10 trucks on the road. I get that a lot, but nobody necessarily breaks down how they're going to get there. They just, they just know that that's a goal of theirs. And if you don't know how you're getting there, it's very hard to actually achieve it. And if you ask those people, why is that your goal? Why do you want that? You're not going to get a lot of answers. Like not really they just answer. don't know. They just know they want this, this thing, but there's no why behind it. Yeah. Why don't you, why don't you want 11 trucks? Well, yeah. I imagine when I have 10, I'll get 11. Well, wait, wait, I thought your goal was 10. So yeah. There's this really great book uh, called The One Thing, where I base a lot of what I do off now off this book, and it, they have this um, theory in there basically called like lining up the dominoes, and that whole like, all right, this is the ultimate long-term 40, 50-year goal, and then in the 10 years before that, this needs to be done, and the 10 years before that, this needs to be done, and the months before that, and the weeks before that, and the days before that, and they basically call it calling it like, lining up your dominoes you know how they have those like things where like they line up like two million dominoes and like hit them and they all go off at once and like there's some mathematical mathematical calculations about the amount of force built by those dominoes and it all sort of like falls in line so if you have this goal and set up all the dominoes behind it like you're gonna hit it because there's gonna be so much force behind what you've done on a day-to-day basis building up to that yeah and like you were talking about the force because they're all in line and everything's been calculated all the way down to the beginning they did the that thing in uh, mit or one of those colleges they did this where they took uh 10 dominoes and the last domino was like 20 feet tall you know giant but it was x amount and they started it with one domino because it was in the exact position they needed to be the exact thing and they 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 knew it from the very first domino how to make it happen when you hit it everything went down flawlessly up to that 20 foot domino just because they they planned it to the beginning there's even ones they've done that are much bigger than that where the dominoes keep getting incrementally bigger and you could basically like knock over a building with dominoes yeah like by lining up big enough pieces and you know mathematically that it is it is possible yeah. it's just super interesting <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know how we got in dominoes, <laughs> but no, that that is that is true. But that's business. I mean, people always look at it too. It takes a certain somebody to be in a business and to make a business work, and all this little stuff that's running in your brain and 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 planning this stuff. That's how you get there. You know, like you said, if you ask somebody why they want ten trucks, it's a measuring contest. They just want it because it sounds good when they're at a conference and they can tell somebody that. You know. Yeah. Yeah, you need to know why you're doing it. Take a poll. You'll you'll see. Ninety percent of the people don't know what the why is. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So, with that kind of out of the way, it's now sold. You're now in WCR. It's a completely different beast, but yet still a business. And that growth, because now that is a nationwide, which was international at, at a point, but that is a nationwide business as compared to a local company. What's what changes in your regrets on a nationwide basis where it's hugely scalable being that it's internet based, it's almost infinite in its scalability as compared to again, a local company. What is now like a big regret in building a national company? Uh, well, when we started it, because I was running two different companies, I didn't have the time. Well, let me, so, let me back up. I had really good success with all county window cleaning at a very young age. And that made me think that, ah, I'm a wizard. I can just go flip this on and it's going to be, (laughs) it's going to be awesome. I'm going to be making millions of bucks instantly. I wildly underestimated how difficult this business is compared to window cleaning. Not that window cleaning is not difficult. It's just difficult in a different way. Different. Yeah. Um, So I had, I I wildly underestimated uh, the market. And I had our original business model um, poorly planned. You know, I, I was just like, all right, I'm going to do it like everybody else. I'm going to get a warehouse and I'm going to load it with stuff and it's going to be awesome and it's going to be great. And we found, you know, around like the 2013, 2014 timeframe, like 
this is a good business model. We have a lot of stuff under our control. We have, you know, 2000 products in here and they're coming in and out. It's working. Things are happening. But I just couldn't move quick enough. So around 2014, Alex and I were sitting in the warehouse one day thinking like and just just talking. We're just walking around talking and we're saying like, you know, like we did this business because we wanted to scale. But we can't even really scale fast enough doing this because we're only controlled by what we could do in this business w w within this warehouse. So I yeah. said, what if we changed it up? Like, what if we change it so we didn't have this giant warehouse? What if we changed it up so we uh, leveraged relationships with customers and manufacturers to in order in order to flip almost instantly from selling 2,000 products to 10,000 products. So we had a massive business change model where we stopped bringing as many things in-house. It's a common yeah. misconception that we don't warehouse anything, but we probably have 500 to 750 SKUs, our best-selling stuff under our control there. And um, we still do that. But now we, we leverage working uh, with different suppliers around the country. We have great relationships with quite a few of them. And yeah. we've brought ideas to the manufacturers we work with in order to be able to leverage their inventory at a deeper level, mainly uh, for two points. One, so we could scale uh, much faster by offering more products. Two, so we could get things to our customers quicker because, all right, yeah, we can ship from New Jersey to California but if we place that order with um, a friendly partner competitor in California, we could then get that to our customer in one day. Right. And then you know, we changed a lot of the way the manufacturers work now. And um, it's been great. We we're able to develop deeper relationships with former competitors. They're now partners and um, deeper relationships with the manufacturers because we represent their product lines really well. And that was a really like super pivotal move from us once we freed ourselves up from having the thought process of everything needs to be contained within this warehouse as opposed to now we have tentacles that reach into 250 different locations around the country that could ship for us. Yeah. Now, now we can move. And once we did that, um, we lost a lot of stress and we – have been able to have a better company because we could service our customers better and offer them more things and get it to them quicker. Yeah, that's the Kodak moment for you, though. That was the, hey, film is not the way to go. What we thought was going to take us the whole way was this film or warehousing everything. You you changed that. The first time you didn't do that in that six years, you had your goal and that was it. You stuck to it. The second time, by learning almost from, I don't want to say mistake, but learning from that kind of way that you did it, you've already kind of proven to yourself that you've learned from the first time doing it yeah and we're in uh we're in a really really great groove with it now um we've uh improved and streamlined a lot of our processes and um it's really been a win-win for everybody uh yeah. it's been a win-win for for us it's been a win for our former competitors now partners and it's been a win from the manufacturers and a win for the customers you know it's been like a big win because everybody's happier everybody's getting more business our customers are getting things at lower prices faster yeah that's a win for me <laughs> yeah. being on board i know yeah so with your 40-year plan what do you see i mean are you constantly changing from your first regret if you will now you're you're seeing it i mean you're doing the same thing where you're progressively changing i can't tell you what my 40-year plan is no, <laughs> we're going to be uh, selling a space. Actually, I just saw a video uh, today uh, of a roof cleaning company that's using a drone. So that's what we see. I just saw that and I instantly <laughs> sent him an inquiry and said, I want to sell this. That's going to work. The window cleaning drones, mm -mm. That, no. that's got legs. Oh, yeah. No, no, uh, no um, ladders. No, none of that. Oh, 100 percent. 100 percent. Yeah. So watch for window cleaning resources. We may be the ones to sell in and just roof cleaning drones. But it's taking our jobs. Um, it, you know what? No, no. It's actually not taking anybody's no, jobs. You still got to operate it. Yeah, it's the roof cleaner that's going to be buying it. And now now it they're probably going to use less chemical. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be safer. 
uh, it's going to be neater, tighter application. I, I see a lot of benefits. Oh, to yeah. That. Yeah. I mean, if you even look at that's a derail it, but where I live now, our roofs are like as straight up. I mean, imagine you don't have to climb. You don't have to do any of that. You just shoot that thing up there. It's pretty awesome. But anyway, same yeah. thing. Innovation changes. So should somebody's plan to kind of to go. So that's pretty awesome that you saw that. So if you if you were to to say that everything's changed regret wise, what have you done in, in the years that you were like, if I could 10 times that decision, I would have. What do you gr- regret doing that wasn't big enough on that one decision? Or was um, there a singular thing that you can remember that made all county what it was like a decision to do this? Uh, I think all county really flourished because when I started it, I had extremely low expenses. I had no commitments, no family, just, it was just like me. I felt like a one man army. I could work 20 hours a day. I can make stuff happen. But then as I started to add people, I really started to get into data and demographics and smart marketing. And, uh, if I could go back in time, I certainly would have put more emphasis on data analysis and smarter, smarter marketing, marketing. Yeah. Work, work smarter, not harder. That's a lot of these guys that fight new technology and fight all this other stuff, but they'll regret it eventually when they, they do finally use it, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm working harder and smarter. So the joke's on them. Boom. (laughs) Double whammy. (laughs) Well, cool, man. Well, I appreciate, I mean, I really just like hanging out with you and getting you to be on the show. It's like pulling teeth from you to me. I know you've been trying so hard to get on the show and I just, I keep blowing you off. We were supposed to record like the past four weeks in a row and I've always had something come up that I made up. But um, I really appreciate you checking us out. I- I'm 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 excited to be able to hang out again at the huge convention too, and uh, I know uh, it's coming up. And again, not to jump on that side of things, but if you haven't gotten your ticket, you have to buy your ticket now. You have to be prepared. This thing is going to be amazing. Buy your ticket and tell me you're going because I want to see I want to see you say high five. You can even give Chris a high five if you see him fly by you at 30 miles an hour. He's pretty good at high fives. <laughs> But um, I definitely appreciate wait, wait, wait. you. Being let, let, let me t- let me take let me take one minute and just uh, tell you some of the cool things that are happening at this year's convention. Yes, yes. Number one, number one, ticket prices go up Sunday at five p.m. Buy your tickets now to save some money because you know you're going to come anyway. Come in early as well because aside from the huge convention and the things we have going on there, we have well at the huge convention we have going on. Uh, an amazing keynote, three awesome main stage speakers that people are absolutely going to love. We have uh, the trade show that opens up after that. Biggest trade show in industry, totally sold out. Vendors were so happy with the turnout last year that they all bought booths immediately. We've never sold this many booths. Trying to get more now. And the next day, it's a whole bunch of classes. Classes and breakout sessions on different topics. But Consider coming in early because this year, due to the success of previous year shows, people wanted to bolt on their little get-togethers to ours. So we have all sorts of stuff going on the day before. Uh, Unaffiliated with the convention for the most part, but we are considering them co-located events and helping these people uh, promote them. Number one, first of its kind, the uh, Service Software Summit. Think of it as like TED Talks for the service industry softwares. So, you know, like the CRMs, the review sites, anybody that offers a cert, like a software into the service industry is going to yeah. be there. And you can go the day before the convention and you can see talks from the CEOs of all those companies. You can wow. get demos. You can see what's going on with those. Because a lot of times people are like, ah, oh, what software do I use? What software do I use? And, yeah. and they, they just don't know. But now you can come and check them all out and see what's right for your business. I think that's really cool. Uh, Kurt Kempton is putting that on who makes response of it. Nice. Uh, also uh, that day, uh, there's a Spray Wash Academy certified plant and property protection course happening. Uh, there's a, a huge hog hunt. Uh, some guys have 
got together to put together a hunting trip and they're going to go shoot hogs. Are you going on that? I uh, would love to. I I'll pull some strings. I I have some preparatory work to do that day that could be detrimental to the convention if I go. You don't have somebody to hand that off to? (laughs) No. Let me continue. I need to be there. Uh, John Tornabine lives up the road for me. He is a parking garage cleaning expert. He's going to be offering an all-day hands-on course. If you've ever wanted to get in the world of parking garage cleaning, come. It's going to be amazing. John does a great job. Yeah, he's There's a good dude. Another, yeah, yeah, he's awesome. There's another Spray Wash Academy uh, course happening that day that's going to be covering uh, roof cleaning and soft washing. And um, – yeah, that's 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 all like the pre-event stuff. But wow. generally, tr- come in early because people hang out in the lobby. You know, you get to just chat with hundreds of other people that do the same thing that yeah. you do every day. Like, instead of yeah. driving your wife crazy with talking about stuff she's not interested in, you can come in, have a drink, or eat a burger with somebody who wants to talk shop with you. And I'm telling you, I've told people this: the classes are amazing, the speakers are great. I get that, but I've learned so much just from networking with people. And listening to somebody sitting in a lobby and somebody going, oh, plastic gift cards. And I, what? I, that changed the amount of money I could make, you know? So just learning everything you can from that. I didn't know all that extra stuff was even going on. So I mean, that's ridiculously awesome. Yeah. Also on the website, there is a whole list that we populated of fun, family friendly things to do in the area. We really encourage people to bring their wife, kids, and make a little vacation out of it. It's a great hotel, a big pool, plus there's plenty of things to do in the area. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. If you don't get your ticket, like you said, it's going up. I'm not going to harp on it anymore. Just go buy it, thehugeconvention.com. Go there, get your ticket, you're going to come, or it's going to be the week of, and you're like, oh, i got to make it happen. Make it happen now, schedule around it. It's better for your business than anything you've ever done for it before. So definitely, definitely check that out. Um, one last time, I am a sales rep for Window Cleaning Resource. So if there's anything I can do for you, if you want me to eat more than ramen, please give me a call, 862-312-2026. If you have any questions on products, I even do a lot of consultation stuff for getting into pure water. And if you have bids that are maybe bigger than you've done before and you want a second opinion, that's what we're here for. We are genuinely the resource for window cleaners. So please reach out to us. And as always, thanks for checking us out. Go back, thumbs up, comment down below if you want to win the swag bag, share the content. I truly appreciate it. And this week's code for your discount is Chrissy Lambo. So there you go. Uh, go out there, make a million dollars, and be epic, and go to the huge convention, would you?